how responsible do we feel to the original material, source material, to the original writer when you're doing the adaptation? I think initially very responsible, and mm -hmm. then that kind of grows yeah. less and less as, as reality yeah, absolutely. sets in. Absolutely, that's my motto too. <laughs> Don't, no respect, no, oh. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> With adaptation, you, you th there's this constant feeling of betrayal, you know, when you start inventing stuff that isn't in the book or mm -hmm. isn't in the... Motion pictures are different than the uh, published word. Uh, the form is different, um, and in some cases, even the purpose of the storytelling or the mechanism of the storytelling, of course, it's different. So there are going to be those, you know, perhaps even necessary uh, moments of betrayal uh, that's there. But I think as long as you're trying to hold fast to the spirit of the story itself, as long as you're you feel that you have uh, in your heart a, a clear understanding of, of uh, what the original intent of the story was and what the intent of the storytellers who are responsible for this motion picture, mm -hmm. what their intent is. And if you can reconcile those, then um, fine. You are, you're going to have to make uh, uh, changes. They're, uh, they're going to be necessary, but what you don't want to do is, is, is take on an assignment and then deliberately go out and just, you know, I, I'm just going to do whatever the hell I want and I'm just going to, you know, and you just go out and you just totally trash right. the uh, source material. Uh, I think writers who are particularly good at, at um, adaptation are in a sense transformational writers where you, you really have to be able to imitate the voice of, I mean, if you're, you're going to be faithful to, to the work. You have to really be able to imitate the voice of the writer. I, I did a movie years ago called The Strawberry Statement and I worked hand in hand with the kid who wrote the book, The Strawberry Statement. It was really difficult. Because he couldn't... Because he would hit me. He was bigger than me. <laughs> I mean, it was... He, he, betrayal wasn't really a, a, It's an better option. to work with the dead authors. Yes. But it's not always the writer. It's the readers and the fans of the books that you've adapted that want to see that book on the screen. You meet a lot of people, or I do, who say, I read the book, hated the movie. Mm -hmm. You got readers who are going there and expecting their favorite moments in the novel, and you might not be able to put it in there. And uh, how do you feel responsible for that? Or do you? You can't really. You can't. No. I mean, first of all, if it's not your favorite moment, you know, right. you have to honor <laughs> yeah. what right. you exactly. believe yeah. in. You know, you spend a long time or I do, it takes me a long time to break the novel apart and really understand what I'm changing and make the changes you have to. And I mean, my policy is if it's already typed and it works, um, you know, I'm, I have no, I'm not trying to get myself in ahead of the author. I'd love right. to use as much as whatever works, you know. Sure. But then because you're reducing it and changing it, everything can't fit the same way. So you have to invent and you have to think of new things. And at a certain point, you have to forget what you had to know so well at the beginning. Because mm. at a certain point, you kind of push the right. other things out to right. make sure that what you have works as its own piece. Ruth, so when you read Howard's End or Passage to India, what, what, what's the first thing you did after you, when you know you're going to adapt it? Usually I've read the novel years ago. Right. And read it again over the years. And before it came to me and say, adapt this. So then, uh, what I do is uh, I read it, I read it again, and then I put it aside. Right. And then I think, um, well, this has a certain form. I've got to find another form. I've got to find another way of telling the story. I've got to change the framework, and I've got to find this. And, uh, you know, well, I'm saying all this as if, if, as if I'm consciously doing it, but actually I'm not. <laughs> Really, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really groping for something. Um, maybe the best example I can give you is uh, a screenplay I did for, uh, the, it was a combination of two novels, Mr. and Mrs. Bridge. Oh, yes, yeah, I love them, yes. And, well, th that is, to the two novels are told in very short chapters, sort of vignette, vign vignettes. But um, I knew this wasn't going to work, 
So finally, what came through for me is to, well, uh, this novel actually tells the lives of this ca ca uh, couple. So I thought, well, let's do it by seasons and start off with spring. Ah. And then, I mean, it seemed a simple structure, but it was something you could really pour their lives into, yeah, into sure. the seasons. It wasn't something that was in the novel. Um, it was it just, I knew this, to make it a film, I just had mm -hmm. to find, one just has to find a different form. I love Mrs. Oh, yeah, Bridge. Yeah, yeah. I love Mrs. Yeah. Bridge. And then when I heard it was being made, I thought, oh, this kills me. It's sickening. <laughs> and then I went and I thought, well, I'm so glad you did it because I wouldn't have done anything nearly as smart and beautiful. And it's a real challenge because of those tiny little... Yeah, that was, yeah. But I thought... But they're wonderful it's... books. They are really wonderful. wonderful. The academic world says, focus on three things. Character, locations, and time. Do you guys think oh, about sure. that? No, I didn't know the academic thing. So, oh, yeah, and just, I didn't I think. I do research. So. I never think of those things. But of course, you think of right. You know who's essential, and who's not. Because in a novel, you can take the time to develop people, that in your two hours, it's harder. So you really need to make some choices. And locations. Location, I don't know. I think our business. I don't know. Think I don't know. No. It's, pre it's important. <laughs> I, I'm always. I, I love the travelogue quality of plays and films. I love plays and films that take me somewhere, you know, some place of privilege I may not. So it's always interesting to me. Really, it's always, is it a story where I want to know what's going to happen? I mean, it's as simple as that, really. And, you know, you think of something like Lawrence of Arabia. That works. It's, for, you know, it's gigantic. It takes place in all these different locations. It's epic. And then you compare it to Twelve Angry Men, which is no less gripping, though much less long. And you're not, the, the fact that you're confined by a location doesn't bother you because you always want to know what's going to happen. I mean, I think, I think it ha it's not more than that. Is there a craft to, like, like you have a quote, Ruth, where you say, it's not a literal, you're not literally translating the book, it's a tapestry. Is that? You said what I said? You did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, oh, you mean you pick out what you can, but it's like I said before, you pick out what you can and you make your own pattern. Or right. You know. I'm, ha I'm st uh, adapting a play of mine and I'm finding it really, really difficult because I'm too faithful to the goddamn right. play. <laughs> I can't seem to let it go, you know? And uh, somehow I've got to get some schizophrenic distance, you know, and pretend I didn't write the play. And but I know my experience when I adapted The Marriage Fool for CBS, I actually loved the teleplay because I got to bring in characters mm -hmm. and I got to dramatize moments that were only talked about in the play. But I think that's what you just said, when you're adapting your own material is harder because it's like, what do I cut if I really love this and it doesn't really work, you know? And um, then, then there is that schizophrenic moment. You, when adapting, adapting your, your novel, the first time Ruth was... The first was, time, and yeah. then another time also with yeah. Ruth and Das. I did it twice. Not my favorite occupation, really, no. to adopt <laughs> your own novel. No. Well, first two things, right? Because you've done the story you've already. Done it. That's right. Yes, yeah, exactly. I don't know. I fooled around once with a, with a play of mine and tried to see if I could adapt it to a screenplay, but I dropped the idea because I felt that it worked so much better as a play than it ever would uh, as a motion picture. So, I, you know, I just kind of left it alone. Um, uh, I think when you write for the stage, um, you're constructing it in a certain kind of way that is specifically designed, uh, you know, right. uh, for, that, for that particular space, that stage area. And turning your play into a motion picture, uh, yuck, you know, uh, I don't, I, I agree with you. You've already written the story, yeah. you know, it was yeah. designed for the theater. It has no business being translated uh, through that little box out there and then turned into all those My only defense of that is shadows. not money, but I remember when my teleplay was on CBS and 25 million people saw it. I wondered how many theaters will I have to fill <laughs> for the rest of my life that they could see this play. And the rerun got 18 million. And I said, wow, 
Uh, that's my only argument. I understand that perfectly. I, you know, there, <laughs> but there are times when I am gripping the 19th century with both hands. <laughs> and I'm, not, and I'm not letting go. <laughs> I was in Paris and I, um, I saw a peniche. There was a boat that was a theater boat, and there were 35 people watching my play. And I said to the guy, "Je suis Auroviz." He went, "No, c'est pas vrai." And, and, and I went and I watched it, and I and I left the boat, and I thought this is kind of a measure of success to have a, a play on a boat <laughs> on the Seine with 35. And I continued my run, and I went near the Bercy Omnisport, the big the big uh, football stadium. And there was a flashing light that Beastie Boys, my son, was coming to, was coming to play, and there were 35,000 seats. <laughs> and I thought, that's another measure of success. <laughs> when you find material, source material, what are the steps you take in thinking about it? You know, not only classic novels, but that obscure book you find on a bookshelf, and you go, I love this story. I'd love to adapt this. And what do I do? I think we start out as writers with a, the idea that what interests the public isn't necessarily in the best public interest. And film studios definitely don't think that way. They want to know what interests the public, full stop. And, and so it's, a, it's really a different approach.